Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Education Table Talk, where we hope if you're joining us, you get some great ideas on what to bring back to your schools, what's happening in education today. So one thing that I think we could all agree on that is happening, not just in education, but in society in general, is the advent of not just technology, because we've always had new technologies come up on the scene, but actually the speed at which technology is entering our society. And one of the impacts of that is it is very difficult to figure out what those careers of the future are going to be in 20 years, 30 years. We barely know what careers are going to be like in two or three years. So this is why for my November talk, I really wanted to bring on an expert about career and technical education. And so I'm really excited to have a colleague that I've worked often with at the Center for Educational Innovation, uh, where he is executive director of career and technical education. And that is John Whitland. So John, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here. I really uh, am looking forward to this discussion today. So Likewise, very- John. Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't lying. You have so much to offer folks watching and listening. So I want to get right into it. And the first question I have for you, John, is a lot of people, when they think of career and technical education or the acronym CTE, they tend to think of what are colleges doing to prepare students for careers, as well as perhaps maybe vocational schools. But can you walk us through, in your opinion or in your definition, what is CTE when it comes to the K-12 space? Sure. So um, a little specific to the high school space. It's a a sequential program where students are working towards a career pathway of their choice. Uh, You mentioned the K through 12 approach, and I would certainly love to see more elements of CTE being brought into younger and younger uh, grade levels. We can get into an international discussion about how how the United States could model some of that. But um, so what it basically means is a a youngster is deciding what uh, what they are interested in in, be, in becoming in the future. And they take a series of courses that other students would just be taking what I would call random electives, but uh, electives that they might be interested in, not necessarily focused or listing in a particular direction. Uh, and within that CTE sphere, the things that you know you get out of the experience in many cases is an opportunity for real work, as we call it work-based learning. It's a whole host of lessons and experiences which culminates in hopefully a paid uh, internship where youngsters get to leave the school and work uh, in offices or on job sites around the city and around uh, various locations for pay, uh, I mind you. And then in addition to that, the kids who complete these programs are eligible to take technical assessments that adult uh, industry professionals take. So imagine being your high school kid, you're, you're enrolled in between seven to 10 courses in an area of interest to you in an area that has been identified by uh, conducting extensive labor market data. And you are working towards that. Now, fortunately, it's never the end of education uh, when they graduate high school. Typically, our kids do go on to some form of post-secondary education. Uh, Nothing wrong with the word vocational, but I like like to use the term post-secondary because Mm -hmm. it encompasses technical training, uh, two and four year colleges. Uh, apprenticeship programs, the military. So it's a whole host of training beyond high school. Nice. And before we came on camera, when we were talking during the week, you were saying that you're actually coming to us at, from a school where you're doing specific CTE work. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about where you are and the the types of career and technical education that the school where you're at is doing? Sure. So I'm, I'm in, you'll find me in schools most days, but today I am at the wonderful Food and Finance High School. Erica Hurtado is the uh, experienced CTE principal. She actually was a principal of two schools, uh, both focused on CTE, one that she was instrumental in getting their uh, aerospace program off the ground, and now here at uh, Food and Finance. And amazing programs. If you want to come visit, you know, get my information at the end. I'd love to to bring you around. We've got some real gems and food and finance is certainly uh, among the best. And which borough in the city of New York is the school? So we're in Man- uh, Manhattan, actually Midtown Manhattan. Nice, nice. So John, so we talked a little bit already about what high schools are doing to prepare students for technical careers. But you know, one question I often get asked is, 
well, you said K-12, John. So what right. could the younger grades be doing to actually start preparing students for their futures? Right. Two things. So the first is we all need to learn about Singapore. So in Singapore, career and technical education, the day you start school, they talk to kids about what their future is going to look like. Again, no one is suggesting this is job training and at a young age, you're now disconnected from uh, education, but it's just to be aware of what is the potential, what exists in reality that you might want to study. So that's one thing, learn, learn more about other places that are doing, in, in a lot of cases, better work than we are at the moment. What Wait, I, rec oh, what I rec ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. What I recommend every school, whether it's elementary, middle, high school, get started right now. What you have, what you have in your buildings are spaces that are ripe for innovation. And at CEI, uh, with our uh, CEO, Michael Culhagen, and, and uh, my direct supervisor, Anthony Orso, we're pushing to create innovation centers within schools. So look to your library, your computer labs that are often you know, secondary spaces and create multiple opportunities like learning centers within these spaces to do things like coding and robotics, engineering. E we happen to do esports, but you know, you can do other kinds of things like that. Uh, artificial intelligence. I know there was a, a short-term ban. Now people realize we have to we have to get moving ahead on that. And any and any other virtual type learning. So create spaces. This is what I recommend. Create spaces in your school to have these innovation centers that allows students to play with things, to get to see what could potentially be in the future. Also, you're going to find you have a lot of teachers in your schools, math, science, or other areas, English who have hidden talents, who know technology, who might have been a coder, might have a degree in engineering, might know how to build a robot, might be able to do those things, or is certainly willing to train. So prior to saying, well, I need money to do all of these amazing things, look in-house, look at your own building, look at your own staff, look at the community that you serve, currently serve, and find a way to do better. I love that, John. And actually, you said several things that resonated with me. And I think we could take this conversation in a number of directions. So I'm going to pick one. I think we're going to, if we have time, I'll go back to the Singapore uh, example that you mentioned. But for now, I was really intrigued when you were talking about the work that CEI is doing in developing these innovation centers. Could you describe what that is or what CEI is doing specifically in that regard? I know, for example, because for the folks watching and listening, John and I actually do work together from time to time. So I know John's big other big area of, of education is esports. So we could talk about that as well. So but anyway, John, wh whatever uh, program you want to talk about, can you describe these innovation centers a little bit more? Sure. Let me just I'll, I'll, I'll focus on the innovation center. So um, we're working with uh, charter and public schools. To, to create these spaces. So if you, if you just understand the cost associated with delivering instruction in any one of these areas, you'll find out rapidly it's so highly cost prohibitive that you couldn't offer. I mean, I rattled off three or four different areas. Um, just imagine the amount of uh, classroom space would be needed to have rooms dedicated to each of these purposes and then to continue with what uh, they had in the past. So within these centers, it's, we're allowing schools to pick and choose, either it's a modular approach or a unit-based approach or project-based approach, or simply bringing in third-party providers if, if it's something you can't do in-house, but it's allowing them to develop, implement, and then radically change. Because as we know, John, you mentioned in your opening, we don't know, you know we're thinking about careers 10 years from now. We don't know what careers might be two years from now. Mm. So, the, so the reality is you need these innovative spaces to teach 21st century skills to students who are going to work over the next 40 years. And we have to, get, we have to start today. I, I, I remember we went to a workshop earlier, uh, this was with uh, principal of Thomas Edison, Moses Ojeda, he, he, he brought me to it at night. I'm really thrilled he did on artificial intelligence. And it was a great presentation showing all these wonderful career opportunities and also some challenges that it's gonna create in the future. And the host basically said, get started now. Don't, don't wait until you're an expert, get started now. So what I recommend and why I, why I believe strongly uh, in CEI's version of what an innovation center can be uh, is that you gotta get started, you gotta get started right now. We can't, we can't wait to think about a five-year plan and then begin to 
to address those needs because in five years, things, everything changes. And you actually led me right to my next question, which is about getting started. So you mentioned that you're at, uh, I believe, the, the food, food school and today. Food yep. and finance, is that it? Yes. yes. So you're there today and you mentioned robotics programs you do and esports programs. But for a school that isn't as versed in CTE, right. to your point about getting started, can you list maybe two to three different things that schools could do to get started in this work? Sure. Let's just start. We'll just say code coding. School is interested in coding. Code Nation offers free training and free curriculum. Um, I, I like to work with Project Lead the Way. Uh, they just it's a one stop shop. It's uh, uh, Rochester Institute of Technology is associated. I like having industry partners, college partners. But for low cost, they'll train your teachers and you'll you will have world class curriculum that 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 culminates in technical assessments. Those are those are two incredibly simple things. Join First Robotics for younger kids, the Lego League. For high school age kids, it's uh, full first robotics. Those are those are ways to get introduced to this. On esports, you bring us in and we train your staff and we teach your kids. We've got lesson plans for uh, every activity that we do because it's more than just playing games. I mean, it is a it is a large uh, multi billion dollar industry uh, that we we open up the eyes of. To tell you the truth, the kids know about it already. We open up the eyes of the adults as to why we need to train more kids. You see many colleges now with esports programs. So, uh, yeah, those are just some, some simple ways to get started. I love that. And then, so you already, you lit up when you talked about esports and these programs that you're doing. So could you walk us through some of the specific successes you've had? Like what makes you get up and do this every day? Because John, you and I, we work in a lot of urban schools right. where there are a lot of challenges. But again, you, you just lit up when you talked about that. So what are those successes that you carry with you from day to day that make you go in and do this work in more schools? Sure. So let me just talk a little bit more about esports. So two schools in particular, Summit Academy in, in Red Hook, Brooklyn, and Boss, uh, which is the business of sports, sports schools. Uh, Jad Schmelzer runs our esports program and our coaches are extraordinary. And we ended last year, John, at Samsung, which is a, another one of our wonderful partners, which we had probably one or 200 people watching and the kids engaged in an activity. And this seven game series uh, for uh, NBA 2K seemed like I'm at the NBA finals. I mean, the 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 animation of the, the players, as well as us fans. I mean, I was yelling and screaming. It was, it, it was I felt like I was at the garden watching the Knicks. So this, the real the realness of this, that it wasn't just, oh, it's a club activity. Oh, I get it. The future is technology based. Uh, another thing that, you know, just gets me out of bed every day in my life is to just be associated with uh, Dr. Kayon Price and the Brooklyn Steam Center. Uh, if you if you want to understand where CTE can go, uh, that is such a, an amazing place and space to see because it is very unique in that it is solely dedicated to career and technical education. And uh, they they started from scratch. You know, we worked together many years ago to get to get to a certain launching point. But since then, they just took it. And uh, you know, the hopes now is to replicate and CEI in my role. We're involved in uh, those discussions and kind of, you know, the guiding behind the curtain, so to speak. So, mm -hmm. you know. So then, John, you talked about this school uh, being dedicated solely or largely to CTE. Yes. So as you were talking, I, I thought of a follow-up question I wanted to ask you, and that is, where's the marriage between CTE and academic learning? So what academic skills, right. as well as life skills, are students getting by participating in these amazing CTE programs? Really great point. So it's, it is inherent in each of these areas that there is a level of academic rigor. Simply, simply, this, if we just discuss literacy, reading, writing, speaking, listening. Uh, in the kitchen, you have to understand weights, measurements of dry and wet goods. You have to be able to read detailed sets of instructions. You have to understand what each of these components, you know, what we would call a recipe, what each of these items are and at what quantities. Baking is literally a science. Whereas I think on the, on the cooking side, 
there's some room for individual flavor baking, uh, you're re absolutely following uh, to the T exactly what is, is happening. And you have to understand the chemical, the chemical changes that are taking place just in the mixing. I was really shocked to learn this uh, from a teacher here. The, depending upon how much mixing you do, John, it goes mm -hmm. from either a, a muffin or then it's pancake batter. Just, <laughs> just, just based on viscosity. Uh, it's amazing. So there are tons of uh, tie-ins to science and certainly to mathematics. But um, every everyone here is a teacher of literacy and every CTE teacher brings in numeracy as as is dictated by their profession. I'll tell you another thing, John, too, and, and, and not to just speak about here, uh, but, you know, there are so many schools and I can go down the list of folks that I would love to, you know, if I had two hours, I would just say how much uh, I learned from folks. And, you know, I started in 1987, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, really the, the father of the SVA program, uh, Dwight Three Persons, who inspired, you know, not just me, but thousands of us who are, who are educators. You know, the city of New York owes him personally a debt of gratitude because there are, I think, 500 of us now that are teachers and principals and superintendents and, and have their doctorates and now have retired. A whole host of us have, have retired and moved on. So I wouldn't I wouldn't have the career I have if someone didn't take a chance on a 19 year old kid from Staten Island, from a graduate of McKee High School. Nice. So John, this is wonderful. The and yes, I wish we had two hours to go over all the wonderful schools doing things, because one of my hopes is those folks listening and watching will get inspiration and perhaps reach out to some of these schools if they're interested in bringing in CTE programs. So again, what we're talking about is all wonderful. It's the utopia. It's what we want all schools to be doing and, and how we want all schools to be preparing their students. Let's, let's look at the other side of that. If CTE programs don't work or when CTE programs don't work, what are the challenges that schools usually face because I think it's worth going into that a little bit now sure. so that way new schools don't fall into those same tra traps. You know, that's a great question, John. Um, I, I mentioned quickly uh, the need to, to conduct labor market data. So that sounds like a wonderful thing to say, wow, our programs are aligned to current industry demands. But there's, there's, a, there's a flip side inherent in my statement, which is, oh my God, our programs are no longer in demand. Right. So this is this is the this is the you know where the rubber meets the road, and fortunately, a well-skilled teacher is malleable enough to train in a different CTE area. Usually, so like I happen to my background is electrical installation and practices, but I taught math. I taught I had a social studies license, and I also taught CAD at Chelsea High School. So if thing when things pivoted. And we brought on an amazing art teacher. Things pivoted. I fell into other areas. So, so the good news is, you know, for the for the staffing side, you need talented people, and we can retrain talented people. But the but what has to happen is schools have to be brave enough to say, you know, we can no longer trade kids, train kids in this particular area. You know, a, go, a good example is in IT, information technology. We started with, you know, low level understanding the basics of a computer. We taught kids how to rip computers apart. I love our A plus computer repair programs. I think they're amazing, but they've morphed into other things other than electronics repair. Apple has a training program. Actually, it's to Thomas Edison. If you really talk to Moses uh, Ojeda, he's just, just, he pivots and innovates daily, actually. So, um, and then you move off into, you know, potentially computer science related areas. Well, if you're not addressing cybersecurity, you're not addressing anything then. It's everything now is cybersecurity. So you have to be willing to pivot. And the folks that you have might not be the experts. So you have to let them go out into industry and train. Mm -hmm. But you have to be honest about that moment to say, I don't think we can know we can do this thing anymore. We have to look forward. So it's really key. It's really key to keep your eye on the, a couple of years down the road. Because we do know ten, it might be too hard to do a 10-year look, even though that's what the Department of Labor does. It gives us these 10-year looks. Right. Right. But so I would just recommend, you know, if I could summarize, not that this is the moment to summarize, just get started, canvas your staff, find those locations, bring me in if you need me. 
bring CEI in if you need us. If, if, we, if we have something that we offer, you can you know, visit our website, but find other folks. Just find those hidden talents and, and go walk your building, find those spaces that you're not currently using or you're using minimally. And you, know, you have 34 computers in it because 10 years ago, someone, you, know, you had money to buy computers, so you put it in a room and you call it a, a, computer, a computer lab. But you know, other, than, other than the one or two teachers that, are real, that really love tech, you know, it's, it's used for limited purposes. So, and I think, I think that these innovation centers are the way to go, to be honest yeah. with you. Again, John, you've mentioned so many great examples of schools. You've talked about different ways that schools can get started, particularly through these innovation centers that you just mentioned. You even gave the folks watching and listening some ideas on what not to do, or at least how to stay current. So that way they're ensuring that the programs that they are offering are going to provide students with benefits down the road. Are there any organizations or resources that CTE schools can access to ensure that they're getting that right advice? Right. Because, for example, when you talked, I was thinking, how would I know what's going to be relevant five years down the road or what industries are coming into play and how right. my school can make those pivots. So who should schools be reaching out to or at least accessing to, to help them plan in advance? Right. Because you can't pivot on, you know, on a dime. You have to be planning for that. Right. So I would, I would recommend going to the New York City Public Schools website and in particular CTE.NYC. Uh, the team did a great job just having all, as many resources as possible. And in fact, some of uh, very current labor market data to suggest what programs you should look at, you know, what, what kinds of fields you should look at uh, that you should be interested in. They're doing great work right now, um, developing options and opportunities for schools. Uh, there's that application process, John, that you could become part of an ever expanding uh, network of schools that offer career pathways, uh, education. And middle school, there is a, there is a requirement of it. Uh, I think it's a unit, one and three quarters units. So now the next step is you go to the New York State Department of Education, their website, and it lists all kinds of organizations, all kinds of curricular resources. I'll give, I'll give everyone, uh, everyone at home a free, cur free curriculum right now. Career and financial management. The entire course of study is available online at NYSED, just type in CFM, CTE, boom, you'll get right to it, download it. You have an entire course. It's split in half between uh, career management and, fin and personal financial management. Two very important things for 100% of kids, regardless of what school you attend. I think we would all agree with that. I, I love that. And so let's pivot, John, a little bit to some questions. So... Uh, Actually, before we do, yeah, we're going to talk about Lisa's question. Before we do that, quickly, why should we look at Singapore? Because they start they start as early as you know, K. Okay, the, the minute kids get into school, they start on uh, learning about different careers. It's just part of their identity as a, as a nation state. They 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 embrace careers. Listen, I think we could look at Germany. We could look at Switzerland. I have an upcoming trip in in mind. To go to both places, I'd love to. I'd love to. As a little, little, uh, you know, little, uh, little plug. Love to. I would love to host schools and bring them and get them to see uh, the apprenticeship model that they have in Europe. But Singapore starts the day kids come to school. I just think that's the envy of the world in that regard. I love that. And you mentioned some very quickly, and then we are going to keep. Let's keep Lisa's question on the on the board because we're Perfect. definitely going there next. Yeah. You mentioned apprenticeship program. What yeah. is that exactly? So that is, that is um, you know, there's an official apprenticeship program that the state approves so that there's training dollars so that a youngster is hired in a particular skill area. So let's just say for myself, it's a, a, an electrician. Studies for three to five years while they're getting paid. They go to school at night, furthering their training. Uh, in the case of IBEW Local 3, they earn an associate's degree while they're becoming a, 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 a Mechanic, electric, electrician, a master electrician, sorry, but not not a licensee, but so that they're able to, a journeyman electrician running jobs uh, throughout the city and rebuilding this great city that we have. I see the question there. So how can schools collaborate with companies? I'm so sorry I didn't mention that's like a, a really key strategy to have. And I'm going to 
and post-secondary to have highly, highly engaged industry partners. So it starts with picking up the phone. It actually starts with looking in your geography. There are many companies surrounding all places. I mean, food and finance is on the west side of Manhattan. Uh, there's a hundred restaurants within five blocks of this place. The Javits Center is actually 10 blocks away. So that, and uh, we've had students work in many of these establishments. So I think picking up the phone, hitting the pavement, uh, and getting them in your building to form partnerships. So uh, definitely, I, I fully support collaborating, but just doing the doing the retail work, uh, getting out the door. When I was the principal of Co-op Tech, on my way to walk into 57th Street, I stopped into many places. Uh, we had an incredible culinary arts program. I walked into restaurants. I walked into some uh, gr uh, grocery chains that had prepared foods, that had 20 people as chefs working behind the scenes, you know, with... Uh, really high-end gourmet prepared foods. And I just found opportunities for kids that way, brought them back in the school. And it really works well when there's a, when it is mutually beneficial to both sides. When we need, when we need technical assistance and sometimes money, and then when they need a, a well-trained entry-level employee, it's, uh, it, it, it works perfectly. Yeah, so another question that came up is how can a school learn more about working with CEI? Well, I'm glad you said that. So our website is www.the-cei.org. John, I don't know how to share my um, my email, but I can give it to you now. J-W-I-D-L-U-N-D at the-cei.org. I love it. And Anyone listening and watching, they could also go on LinkedIn and find John as well. Uh, yeah. he, he's there as well. So, John, before we conclude. I can't uh, believe I'll, the half hour is up. What, what I, I told you it's going to go fast, me. John. It's going to go fast. But before we conclude, uh, if I get another question here, I'll bring it up on the screen. But otherwise, anything that you felt we didn't cover that you really want to talk about. I would add we didn't talk about the equity piece, how it really helps students get more community or have access to more community resources to to stop that cycle of poverty but what do you feel we haven't talked about i mean we could spend 30 minutes discussing equity because it's wonderful to have a program but if it's in one part of town and not there's no access or, or across town for that so i think i think equity is a major issue that really de deserves its own its own half hour but uh, as an example of that, John, stressing it, so we have to, we have to really l look critically at ourselves and develop programs and schools in communities of colors that are greatly underserved. Uh, one, of the, one of the expansion efforts of the Brooklyn STEAM Center is in the Bronx in healthcare specifically, because there are so few opportunities currently for students in the Bronx. Sadly, um, the further up you go, and this is what we, we conducted uh, labor markets uh, data, the further up you go, the food chain with career attainment, once you get into the clinical positions, uh, representation of communities of color, it just disappears, even in hospitals in the Bronx, even in medical facilities in the Bronx. So my God, I, 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 wish, I wish, we, uh, wish we started the show and just did that because it is, it's, it's my lifetime's work. As a matter of fact, the SVA program that I mentioned earlier, that's the purpose of it is to bring students of color into into the classroom that were just lacking somehow someone believed in me gave me a shot but the reality is you know john i believe representation matters and we need to do a better job of that uh hopefully from this side i'm training young people to take over as leaders i'm very proud of the fact that uh it's six it might actually be seven seven of uh colleagues i worked with in the past that you know hopefully I had a positive impact on, later became principals. And most, if not all, were persons of color and female. Mm. You know, the other thing that we don't have time for, but you're reminding me, it could be another episode. And that's looking at how rural schools could actually benefit from these kind of programs as well. When they're not right next to a university or right next to, uh, you know, a, a bio lab, so to speak. But uh, right. I think that's going to have to wait. But John, you already <laughs> talked a lot about uh, where people can find you, the resources that they could access. Anything that we've forgotten that you just want to mention here in terms of uh, where people can reach out to you or how people can find more about your work? 
Well, you know, listen, just uh, Google me. You know, my name pops up and CEI becomes at the top of that list. And you get, you'll get to me that way. My email is, at, is in a bunch of places. So it's just John Widland, W-I-D-L-U-N-D. Uh, some, some, some of it's good online. You know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it all is, but, you know, take a look. <laughs> let, me know, let me know if I should worry about something. I, I think it's okay. But uh, listen, John, I, I, um, I had a 33-year career. I started in 1987, and I left around the uh, start of the pandemic. Some people said I had perfect timing. But, um, you know, I got to reflect on, on my career while, while you take a year and a day to, sort of just to regroup. We took COVID off, my wife and I. And, um, you know, I just had the opportunity to work with CEI, and it's just been, it's just been amazing. So uh, I'm happy to help in any way I can. I love that, John. And you you might have retired from the system, but obviously, clearly, you're still providing massive support, uh, needed support to schools. And, and I'm actually glad to be a colleague of yours. So, John, thank you so much for being here with us today. I really appreciated it. Thank you. And I wore a tie for you, John. You did. And I said before, that's not common, folks. So enjoy. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate you joining today. Thank Thanks, you. John.